You're listening to the Wildish Podcast, hosted by Hannah Fay. Hello, my friends, and welcome back to the Wildish Podcast. I'm your host, Hannah Fay. It has been a little bit of a minute since I uh, made another podcast episode, but I wanted to say thank you guys so much for your love on the first episode. Um, I'm still new to this whole podcasting world, so please bear with me in uh, me figuring out how I want to go about doing this podcast. Um, I missed doing the video aspect of the first episode because I really just didn't like how the video aspect turned out. The audio came out great. I really love how the audio sounded. Um, The video part on the other hand, I just really wasn't proud of it, so I just didn't end up uploading it. But I will for sure be uploading this this episode's video one, so if you'd like to see my new setup and everything on the video aspect of the podcast, check out my YouTube channel, at Hannah Faye. And if it's not up, please hold me to it. Like, you know, yell at me on anything possible to make sure that I put up the video aspect of it. Anyway, for today's episode, I want to talk about the history of the Ouija board. Now, as someone who loves all things paranormal, spooky, scary skeletons, I know of Ouija boards. However, I am scared of them. I have not ever tried to use a Ouija board, and I do not ever plan on using a Ouija board. Um, I feel like I would have to be feeling real brave to uh, use a Ouija board just because I have heard way too many crazy stories and experiences of demons and just poltergeist activity that's occurred with people who have used a Ouija board and just some really bad experiences. And I personally am not willing to put my life at risk to test out if a Ouija board is real or not. But for this, I'm not just going to be talking about my personal opinion. We're actually going to be diving into the history of the Ouija board. Where did it come from? Where did it start? And why is it that everyone nowadays is terrified of Ouija boards? Because actually, when they first came out, people loved the idea of Ouija boards. People weren't scared of Ouija boards, but we'll get all into that. So our story starts back in the 1800s. In February 1891, the first few advertisements started appearing in papers. Ouija board, the wonderful talking board, describing a magical device that answered questions, quote, about the past, present, and future with marvelous accuracy and promised never failing amusement and recreation for all the classes, a link between the known and unknown, the material and immaterial. Another advertisement in a New York newspaper declared it, quote, interesting and mysterious and testifies as proven at patent office before it was allowed. Price $1.50, end quote. Can you imagine being able to actually purchase a board game for $1.50? Nowadays, you're lucky if you find a good board game for 10 bucks. But anyway. (laughs) So if you don't know what a Ouija board is, a Ouija board is a flat board with the letters of the alphabet, um, the English alphabet, I should say, uh, arrayed in two arched rows with the numbers zero through nine written below it, and the words yes and no in the uppermost corners and goodbye written at the very bottom of the board. You use a piece called a planchette, which is like a teardrop shaped device um, with a little window at the tip of the body, and you use that to maneuver about the board. The idea is that two or more people would sit around the board and place their fingertips on the planchette ask a question, and watch as the planchette moves from letter to letter or number to number, spelling out the answers to your questions, seemingly by some mysterious force. Now, Ouija historian Robert Murch has been dedicated to researching the story of the Ouija board ever since 1992. When he started his research, he says no one really knew much about its origins, which striked him as odd. He said, quote, 
for such an iconic thing that strikes both fear and wonder in American culture, how can no one know where it came from? End quote. Which I 100% agree. But the Ouija board, in fact, came straight out of the American 19th century obsession with spiritualism, the belief that the dead are able to communicate with the living. Now, spiritualism, which had been around for years in Europe before, it hit America hard in the in 1848 with the sudden prominence of the Fox sisters in up na- upstate New York. The Foxes claimed to receive messages from spirits who knocked on the walls to answer questions. They would go around parlors all across the state. And aided by the stories about the celebrity sisters and other spiritualists, the new national spiritualism reached millions of people at its peak in the second half of the 19th century. Now, it was actually acceptable and even like a wholesome activity to contact spirits through seances. The movement also offered comfort in an era when the average lifespan was less than 50. Even Mary Todd Lincoln, yes, the wife of President Abraham Lincoln, conducted seances in the White House after her 11-year-old son died in 1862. During the Civil War, spiritualism gained many supporters. People were desperate to connect with loved ones who had gone away to war and never ended up coming back. And as spiritualism grew in America, so did the frustration with how long it took to get any meaningful messages out of the spirits. See, Brandon Hodge, who is a spiritualism historian, describes how before Ouija boards, mediums would call out the alphabet and wait for a knock at the right letter, number, etc. until they got their message. So you can imagine getting even just a two-sentence long message from a past family member would take forever. You have to go through the alphabet one letter at a time and wait and hope that a knock will happen right at each letter needed to spell out the message. So people were desperate for methods of communication that could be a lot quicker. In 1886, the Associated Press reported on a new phenomenon taking over spiritualist groups in Ohio, the, quote, talking board. It was the beginnings of the Ouija board with letters and numbers and a planchette-like device used to point them. The article went far and wide, but it was Charles Kennard of of Baltimore, Maryland, who actually acted upon it. In 1890, he pulled together a group of four other investors to start the Kennard Novelty Company to exclusively make and market these new talking boards. Now, none of them were necessarily spiritualists, but they were just keen businessmen who knew they had identified a niche market that they could infiltrate. Now, contrary to popular belief, I even thought this is where the origins of the name Ouija board or Ouija came from, but Obviously, in doing my history, I realized it wasn't necessarily true. Ouija is actually not a combination of the French word for yes, we, and the German word ja, meaning yes. (laughs) I'm sorry if that like sounded really bad or offensive. I really don't mean for it to. But Robert Murch says that based on his research, it was actually Bond's sister-in-law, Helen Peters, who was a strong medium who came up with the name. They had been sitting around the table and they actually asked the board what they should call it. And the name Ouija came through. Also, if you don't know, Ouija is spelt O-U-I-J-A. I don't think I clarified that before, but now you know. So Ouija came through and when they asked what it meant, the board replied, good luck, which is really cryptic and eerie when you think about it. But Also, it should be noted that Helen did acknowledge, though, that she was wearing a locket bearing the picture of a woman with the name Ouida um, above her head. Now, the story that emerged from the Ouija founder's letters, it seems really possible that the woman in the locket was the famous author and popular women's rights activist Ouida, who Helen Peters really admired, and that the name Ouija was just a... misreading of that name and that's where she came up with it but supposedly the claim is is that the board came up with the name 
According to Robert Murch's interviews with the descendants of the Ouija founders and the original Ouija patent itself, the story of the board's patent request is actually true. They knew that if they couldn't prove that the board worked, they wouldn't get their patent. So Bond brought Helen Peters to the patent office in Washington along with him when he filed the application. There, the chief patent officer demanded a demonstration, and if the board could accurately spell out the chief officer's name, which was supposed to be unknown to Bond and Peters, um, he would allow the patent application to, pro to proceed. So, of course, they all sat down, spoke with the spirits, and the plant chat magically spelt out the patent officer's name. Now, whether or not it was actually mystical spirits or the fact that Bond, who was a patent attorney, may have just known the man's name without man knowing it, it's unclear. No one knows for sure. But on February 10th, 1891, the visibly shaken patent officer awarded Bond the patent for his new game. Thus, the Ouija board was born. The first patent offers really no explanation as to how the device actually works. It just asserts that it does. And it's believed that the ambiguity and mystery of the Ouija board was part more or less of conscious marketing. The more mysterious the board seemed, the more people wanted to buy it. Merch said, quote, ultimately it was a moneymaker. They didn't care why people thought it worked, end quote. And it was indeed a moneymaker. By 1892, the Kennard Novelty Company went from one factory in Baltimore to two in Baltimore, two in New York, two in Chicago, and one in London. The board would find its greatest popularity in the most uncertain of times, when people were looking for answers from just about anywhere, especially cheap mystical games. In the 1910s and 20s, with the devastations of World War I, they and witnessed a surge in Ouija popularity. During the Great Depression, the Fold Company opened new factories to meet demand for the boards. Over five months in 1944, a single New York department store sold 50,000 of them. Like, that's crazy. And in 1967, the year after the Parker Brothers bought the game from the Fold Company, two million boards were sold, outselling the popular game Monopoly. Can you imagine there was a point in which Ouija boards outsold a game as notable as Monopoly? Like, everybody was doing it. Everybody was using a Ouija board. So I feel like it's understandable, especially with the spiritualist movement and everybody kind of considering, you know, talking to the dead as more of a like healing and comfort thing, along with all of the shit that everyone's going through at the time, they were just looking for comfort wherever they could and a way to come to terms with the people that they loved passing in such horrific ways. So I feel like it makes a lot of sense that when all of this is going on, they're looking towards the Ouija board. And of course, as we all know, the more popular something is, the more likely more people are going to try to use it. Around these times, strange Ouija tales were also making frequent appearances in American newspapers. In 1920, National Wire Services reported that crime solvers were turning to their Ouija boards for clues in, in the mysterious murder of a New York City gambler, Joseph Burton Elwell, much to the frustration of the police. In 1921, the New York Times reported that a Chicago woman had been sent to the psychiatric hospital, and she tried to explain to doctors that she wasn't suffering from mania, but that the Ouija spirits had told her to leave her mother's dead body in the living room for 15 days before burying her in the backyard. In 1930, two women in Buffalo, New York, who had murdered another woman, claimed that the murder was supposedly encouraged by Ouija board messages. So, of course, with every good, there are some twisted cases. But like I said, the overall consensus of the Ouija board was that it was nothing to be afraid of. So what changed? How do we go from everybody loving 
to use it and looking at it as a way of communicating with those who have passed to us, like people like myself, being terrified of demonic possession. Well, Robert Murch makes the connection to, in 1973, the movie The Exorcist scared the hell out of people in theaters. And with all that supposedly based on a true story, and the implication that the 12-year-old character Reagan was possessed by a demon after playing with a Ouija board by herself, this definitely changed how people saw the Ouija board. He says, quote, it's kind of like Psycho. No one was afraid of showers until that scene. It's a clear line, end quote. See, he explains that before The Exorcist, film and TV depictions of the Ouija board were actually usually pretty jokey and silly. For example, I Love Lucy featured a 1951 episode in which Lucy and Ethel hosted a seance using the Ouija board. Robert continued to say, quote, but for at least 10 years afterwards, it's no joke. The Exorcist actually changed the fabric of pop culture, end quote. Almost overnight, Ouija became a tool of the devil, and for that reason, a tool of horror writers and movie makers. It began popping up in scary movies, usually opening the door to evil spirits hell-bent on tormenting humans. Now, outside of the theater, the following years saw that the Ouija board was denounced by religious groups as Satan's preferred method of communication. In 2001, in Alamogordo, New Mexico, it was being burned on bonfires along with copies of Harry Potter and Disney's Snow White, which that's pretty crazy. I might have to do an episode looking into what was going on over there, but even within the paranormal community, Ouija boards kind of have a dodgy reputation. Robert Murch says that when he first began speaking at paranormal conventions, he was actually told to leave his antique boards at home because they scared people too much. The Parker Brothers and then later Hasbro, who would later acquire Park Brothers in 1991, still sold hundreds and thousands of them. But the reason why people were buying them had changed significantly. Ouija boards were spooky rather than spiritual, and even possibly dangerous. But the real question is that I know I'm wondering, and I'm sure you're probably wondering then, is how do Ouija boards even work? Now, I personally do believe in some aspects of the Ouija board. Hell, I'm also not, like I said, I'm not going to test it out on my own. Like, I'm not trying to have those effects the negative effects happen to my life if it is true. There are just far too many horror stories and people who have claimed to have demonic possessions and poltergeist activity in their lives post using a Ouija board for me to judge any one person's story. However, I do also have to consider the fact that when sitting around at a table with other people, fingers placed on this delicate object in front of them, how can you definitively say that no one had anything to do with the planchette moving, even unconsciously? Now, the supposed scientific explanation for the mystery that is the Ouija board comes down to one theory, the endometer effect. Now, around 2010-ish, Dr. Ron Rensink, professor of psychology and computer science, Helen Guaucho, psychology postdoctoral researcher, and Dr. Sidney Fells, professor of electrical and computer engineering, all began looking at exactly what happens when people sit down to use a Ouija board. Now, Sidney Fells claims that what sparked his questioning amongst them started with actually a Halloween party. He brought out a Ouija board at a Halloween party attended by graduate students, including many of who were unfamiliar with how it works. They assumed that it required batteries, and Fells recalls giving them some mystical explanation tied into Halloween and that, and they all had a good laugh. But he did tell them it does not require batteries. And lo and behold, when Fells returned later, the grad students were all captivated because the planchette was moving on its own, or so it appeared. 
the supposed mechanism at work is something known as the endometer effect, which refers to the influence of the unconscious mind on muscle movements. So him and his team later decided to do some research and test it out. Their initial experiments involved a Ouija playing robot. Participants were told that they were playing with a person in another room via teleconferencing. The robot, they were told, mimicked the mo mimicked the movements of the other person in the other room. In actuality, the robot's movements amplified the participants' motions, and the person in the other room was just a ruse. So the participant themselves thought they were not in control. Participants were asked a series of yes or no fact-based questions and expected to use the Ouija board to answer them. Now, what the team found really surprised them. Before the Ouija board was put into play, when participants were asked verbally to guess the answers to, their, to the best of their ability without using a Ouija board, they were right only about 50% of the time, which is a typical result from guessing, right? But when they were answering using the board, believing that the answers were coming from the other person, they actually answered correctly up, uh, upwards of 65% of the time. Bell said, quote, it was so dramatic how much better they did on these questions than if they answered to the best of their ability. That we were like, it's just weird. How could they be that much better? It was so dramatic, we couldn't believe it, end quote. The implication was, as Fells explained, that one's non-conscious mind was a lot smarter than anyone knew. So they did devise another experiment just to further see if their theory was, you know, somewhat based in fact. This time, rather than having a robot, the participant actually played with another real human. Both people would sit at the table with a Ouija board in front of them. Then, at some point, the participant was blindfolded, and the other player, who was actually in on the experiment, would quietly take their hands off of the planchette. This meant that the participant who was blindfolded believed that he or she was not alone because they had seen another person sitting there with them, but it still ensured that the answers could only come from the one participant. And sure enough, it worked. Rensink says, quote, some people were complaining about how the other person was moving the planchette around. That was a good sign that we really got this kind of condition that people were convinced that somebody else was there, end quote. Their results replicated the findings of the first experiment with the robot that people knew more when they didn't think they were in control of the answers, 50% accuracy for their vocal responses and the 65% for their Ouija responses. Now, honestly, these experiments really do, for me at least, put into question the overall experience of the Ouija board. But that doesn't necessarily change my full perspective. I like to think of myself as a skeptical believer when it comes to paranormal phenomena. Some things I really can't explain and just add to me truly believing in ghosts. But I also can't deny some evidence against some specific experiences. But it doesn't necessarily negate all experiences. Like I said, there are some pretty crazy Ouija board related stories. For example, William Fold, the guy who at one point owned the Ouija board, writes, yeah, he himself also had some weird Ouija related trouble. So, with the popularity of the Ouija board, he had continued to open up new factories, building the largest, a three-story building in Baltimore, after the Ouija board itself told him to, quote, prepare for big business. In early 1927, he went up to the roof of the building to supervise the replacement of a flagpole. Now, according to the Baltimore Sun, quote, he was standing near the edge of the roof, grasping an iron support of the pole to steady himself the workman said, when the support suddenly pulled away and he toppled over backward, end quote. Now, Fold initially grabbed hold of a windowsill of an open window when suddenly it closed on him, sending him crashing down to the sidewalk below. He had broken several ribs but was expected to survive. But that's not the craziest part. 
He was expected to survive until a bump in the road on the way to the hospital sent one of his fractured bones through his heart and he died. Like, that's so sad. No, yes, obviously that could just be as simple as a freak accident. Think of it as you may. I think it's freaky. But another recognizable presence connected to the Ouija board, who is generally known throughout the paranormal community, is the demon Zozo. Now, Zozo the demon is a mysterious entity known for stalking people through Ouija boards. Those who have claimed that they've made contact with Zozo say he often shows himself by guiding the planchette into like figure eight formations and then frantically zooming back and forth the planchette between Z and O, just back and forth, back and forth. And that's basically how you know that it's him. His interactions start off pretty average with most Ouija board experiences, nothing too crazy, but it grows in malice. He's known for cursing at and threatening those who have contacted him. Now, his exact origins are a bit fuzzy. There are hundreds of stories of experiences with him and other demonic entities from Ouija board connections. Now, whether you believe it or not, to be honest, my advice is just to be careful. And if you're going to do any Ouija board rituals or seances of any sort, make sure you aren't doing anything disrespectfully. And good damn luck, because sis, that ain't going to be me. And that is the history of the Ouija board. Pretty interesting, right? Like, I'll be honest, I didn't realize it was basically just a marketing toy, you know, and that it was so common back in the day and that people didn't look at it as something to be scared of. But honestly, I feel like it makes sense that after movies started kind of implementing the idea that there's some demonic forces behind it and that it could lead to some pretty scary experiences, that's enough for me to never buy one and never try to use one. But let me know what you guys thought. Have you ever used a Ouija board? Do you have any weird experiences? Or did you have no experience at all? That's also really interesting for me to find out. Or do you know anyone else who has used a Ouija board? And maybe that's why you don't want to use one yourself also. Thank you so much for joining me on this history into the Ouija board. I hope you found it interesting. And if you did, please feel free to share this podcast with your friends, families, enemies, whoever really, and to subscribe wherever it is that you listen to podcasts. And if you're watching the video version of the podcast over on my YouTube channel, please be sure to give it a like and to subscribe down below. I would greatly appreciate it. Otherwise, I hope you guys have a great rest of your week, and I will see you guys next time. Bye, guys. Thank mm -hmm. you.